Hello, poetry lovers. This is Blaster Al Ackerman. Here's a poem I call 500 that I, it's a favorite of mine and I, I hope of yours. The 500 pound man on the bus. The 500 pound their meat. Hello, boys and girls. This is Blaster Al Ackerman. This is a poem with no title, and I call it Untitled. Jugged hair. Maybe it could save the world. But the son of a bitch had body odor. Oh, ego, ego, ego. Hello, poetry lovers. This is Blaster Al Ackerman. This is a poem I wrote over 20 years ago after I had a kidney stone. It's called A Squirrel as Large as a Human Being. A squirrel as large as a human being. I dreamed unrequitedly of finding one someday and making her my bride, and this vast hole of disappointment in my life led to my becoming an alcoholic. I beat alcoholism by becoming a dope fiend. I beat dope by wrapping a big furniture pad around my loins and hips and crawling around and around on the floor with a hand puppet named Bing. At this point, my family became alarmed and sent me to see Dr. Saunders, a shrink who had his office downtown and on the third floor of the old transit building. Dr. Saunders sat there behind his desk listening to my story and doodling with his beautiful pen on the back of his hand. He also pulled at his collar, ran his hands through his hair, adjusted his glasses, tapped his feet, sucked his teeth, shrugged his shoulders around and around inside his too tight jacket as though he had worms and made continual, unattractive facial expressions. The man was a mass of nervous tics and twitches. This put me off to such an extent that I lost the thread of what I was saying something about big bushy tails, and stopped talking. After that, I sat there unhappily, looking down in silence at my furniture pad and, and bing. <clears throat> Dr. Saunders cleared his throat. What you need, he said firmly, are some good and appropriate companions. I blinked, not understanding Inappropriate companions? That's right. Find some real scuzz bags to pal around with. Have some fun. Go out and roll a few bums in the park. It'll do you a world of good. Woo-woo, he added suddenly, standing up and moving to the door like a train. Well, it's been a real pleasure talking to you, he said with his hand, with the writing on it on the knob. Thanks for all your help. And out he went going, woo-woo, woo-woo, down the hall to the stairs, leaving me there in his office alone, more uncertain than ever about what I should do. After that, the evening came on. The office entered deep shadow. Ahead was the cosmetology school where my family talked of sending me an ad in the back of a journal looming the name of the lake, a Spartan manly regime that I knew I would hate from day one, a red brick building under pines, push-ups in the dusk, whistles blowing and flashlights bobbing around, no smoking, no laughing, no bedwetting, no grab-ass, no eyebrows, no features to call my own face and never a 
chew, never a chaw, while my jaws ached for the sweet taste of Piper Heisdicker. But my mind was not on the chaw, nor the school, nor anything my family could do to me. I was thinking of how I would never marry because who can find a squirrel as large as a human being? Hello, poetry lovers and hosers. This is Blaster Al Ackerman, and here's a poem I wrote this morning. It's called The Front Door. The Front Door. Should you wake up at noon to find... Ugh. To the sound of someone digging up the backyard and find your mom has left a note on the kitchen stove. I have no idea who that maniac in the backyard is. It might be best if you depart through the front door. This is a Pepper Young translation of a, of a beautiful poem by John M. Bennett. John's poem is called Lays, written back in uh, 630.04. And I've translated it using the uh, Pepper Young system, which is the restraint here is that all the, uh, the only letters that can be used in, in, this, uh, in this poem are the letters that appear in the name Pepper Young. And since Pepper Young was a... Uh, was a, a very popular soap opera back in the 30s and 40s. I, I'll read this poem with a uh, bar of soap in my mouth. And here it is. This is uh, the Pepper Young translation of the John M. Bennett poem, Lays. Instead of evil. What is this shyness about dangling arms or no arms at all when you have three legs? What is living with a moth compared to half an hour in front of a bathroom and a handkerchief? 
What is the actual advantage that you can find in comparing bathroom and a handkerchief to perhaps wrapping it in these flour tortillas Jesse brings for his lunch and pretending you didn't? And while we're on the subject, what wouldn't end strangely in the shape of a monstrous flying tenderfoot mucus lamp? Suppose you ask yourself all these things and there turned out to be no proper answer. You might find yourself wandering around with a basket asking people, am I a brownie? Have I ever been a brownie? <laughs> then what? Are you really prepared for the sort of conversations with the sort of people this will lead to? Have you no pride? Well, it's a lot to think about. But, and here's the point, probably it would be best if you left off trying to make out this small print. Best if you stopped reading right now, in fact, if only to concentrate more fully on your drinking and driving. Crash! What my Bible did for me. I was studying my Bible the other night, and my mom, who used to be a hippie in the long ago hate ashbury days and still likes to reminisce about flower power and the summer of love came in my room to ask me if i'd seen any of her old black sabbath albums i said <coughs> yes i burned them all last week mom and when she expressed disbelief and consternation over this and even started to cry i, I pointed out to her how it was really for her own good she just stood there shaking her head while i did my best to explain about black sabbath how they're one of the satanic rock groups. If you play any of the Black Sabbath LPs backwards, you can hear a subsonic satanic message being delivered. It's a well-known, well-documented fact. There are a lot of these satanic rock groups that have satanic albums in circulation, especially groups from the 60s. I told Mom this was the, the reason I also had to burn all of her Beatles and Blue Cheer LPs too, along with the ones by Black Sabbath a regular auto de fe of the satanic subliminals. When she heard this, Mom ran out of the room moaning, John, Paul, George, Ringo. And I went back to studying my Bible. That's when the idea hit me. I had like this flash of sudden inspiration. I took my Bible and started on the last page, which is where the revelation of St. Phil ends the book. I should probably explain here that the Bible I use is the special Morris Farmer New Revised Jovian Version, which was channeled through Dr. Farmer two years ago when he met with the advanced space beings, Arnina and Tebow, at the Wigwam Motor Lodge outside Palo Alto, California, and learned, among other things, the secrets of Big One Mind, an exciting new biblical prophecy for the coming millennium said knowledge of which enabled him to rewrite completely both the Old and New Testaments, plus also tour the country successfully selling autographed copies of his Bible and leading study and meditation workshops where he, he asked questions like, what is love? And have you ever jumped out of a hotel window in Havana? As I say, I took my Bible and turned to the last page. Then I began reading backwards. I figured if there were any hidden satanic messages in my Bible, this was the best way to find out. I mean, you can't be too careful. In the next few hours, I read clear through the revelation of St. Phil, going backwards the whole way, and then I started at the end of the second epistle of Bev and read that backwards too. And I just kept on going like that all night. By morning, when streaks of pink and gray were beginning to show at my window, I had reached the end, or rather the beginning of the true book of Moses, which in the new revised Jovian version is like the midway point. It occurred to me that this might be a good place to knock off for a while and give my eyes a breather. So I closed my Bible, being careful to mark my place with a matchstick, and stood up and stretched, whereupon I noticed how my all-night session of reading backwards had left me feeling a little queer. My head seemed to buzz. Walls, rug, furniture, everything around me looked funny. I decided a bite of breakfast was probably what I needed. Walking backwards, I entered the bathroom and in a preoccupied fashion looked around to see what I might find to rustle up for myself. The fact that I seemed to be doing everything backwards registered only dimly, 
My brain felt so awash with strange sensations and oddness. The soap had a scummy green taste, and I finally settled for a few mouthfuls of toothpaste. Next, I walked backwards into the kitchen, sat down at the table, and had a BM. Someone in a frumpy green robe and pink hair curlers, it took me a few seconds to realize it was Mom, came into the kitchen and started screaming at me, What on earth do you think you're doing? Have you lost your mind? Of course, her words were sheer gibberish to me until I thought to reverse their order. Doing? You think you do earth on what, etc.? And could at last make sense out of what she was shrieking? And shrieking, she just kept it up, growing more and more hysterical. All that noise and ruckus was making my head feel worse. Finally, in exasperation, I tried to quiet her down with a good swift uppercut to the jaw. <coughs> Naturally, swinging in reverse the way I did, I caught myself squarely on the point of my own jaw and went out like a light. When I regained consciousness a few minutes later, I could hear Mom carrying on in the next room. She was yelling things into the phone. Send an ambulance! Send a doctor! My poor son's gone completely crazy. He's having bowel movements in the kitchen table. I was still feeling groggy, and it took me a while to reverse the order of her words and understand what she was saying. That's when I decided it would probably be best for me to depart the house and avoid any further unpleasantness. So I did. I crawled backwards out the door, across the porch, and down the steps, and on around to the garage where my car was. I got in my car, started the motor, and drove out of the garage, doing everything backwards. Doing everything backwards caused me to put the car in forward instead of reverse, so that I exited the garage by surging ahead and crashing straight through the back wall. Once I was out in the alley with pieces of lumber falling off the hood and bumper, I put my car in reverse and began driving in the direction of the Frito plant where I work. Of course, as you might imagine, driving backwards carried me away from, not towards, the plant. I was about eight miles out of town on an unfamiliar farm-to-market road when the strain of so much reverse driving burned out a bearing and my car stalled in a cloud of greasy brown smoke. <laughs> Wearily, I climbed out of the car and began hiking toward the nearest gas station, walking backwards along the shoulder of the road and watching the gas station get further and further away with every step I took. At last, it disappeared behind a hill. I continued to trudge along backwards for another hour. At some point, I realized that my backwardness, at least some of it, was starting to wear off. I could tell it was starting to wear off by the way I gradually found myself walking sideways. I was walking sideways just like a crab does, scuttling really. In this manner, I quickly left the road altogether and crossed several fields. And I don't know, but, but somehow when you're moving sideways at a rapid clip, it's a lot different from moving forwards or, or even backwards. It puts you in a much stranger frame of reference. It's hard to explain except to say that in moving continuously sideways, I began to see things I'd never noticed before. For one thing, I was seeing everything at right angles. I became aware of the odd intervals that separate everything when you view the world from the sidelines, so to speak, rather than meet it head on. And as I looked more closely into the shadowy intervals that lie between things, I perceived a multitude of hidden wires and pulleys busily at work. A wave of sick vertigo overcame me at the sight of all this mechanistic contrivance going on behind the scenes and in the interstices, and, and I lost consciousness. When I came to myself again, I was in a dark cranny at the bottom of a tidal pool. Small fish were swimming past my hiding place, quite oblivious to my presence. I saw the pincer-like claw of a hermit crab dart out to snare one of them, and I realized it was my own claw I was seeing. This threw me into such a profound shock. What? Me a crab? That I even went a little nuts. Later I regained my equilibrium and was able to carry on my normal crab-like functions. However, I have not been able to shake off the feeling of being in a dream. Even now I find myself wondering, am I a crab who dreamed he was a Bible nut? Or am I a Bible nut still dreaming he's a crab? Hell if I know which. Starkley Davenport was a name I used back in the 80s when I was 
editing this bogus poetry magazine called the Edgar Allan Poe Messenger. The Edgar Allan Poe Messenger billed itself as a forum for the best in Southern poetry. This meant in nearly every instance poems and features that centered themselves squarely in the grand old Southern traditions of incest, madness, necrophilia, bestiality, mopery, shacking, and more often than not, congenital feeble-mindedness. The magazine was a hoax from start to finish, and inspired by the twin specters of Poe and Faulkner, the Edgar Allan Poe messenger dwelt in depth on these themes relentlessly. And although publishing these terrible southern poems was ostensibly its thing, each issue of the magazine was also built around an editorial statement. This is where Stark Lee Davenport came in. Stark Lee Davenport, the old South poet of Richmond, Virginia, as he called himself, was the name I edited the magazine under, and each editorial was, in fact, uh, an episode out of Stark Lee's life, which is really pretty much all you need to know about the following piece, aside from the fact that Stark Lee's friend, the character known as Linoleum G. Nesby, was frequently described in the series as a handicapped person who nevertheless manages to lead a very full life. In addition to her budding career as a gospel singer, songwriter, Miss Nesby is in constant telepathic communion with her dead sister, whom she refers to as Sister. Return with us now to the August 1984 issue of the Edgar Allan Poe Messenger and the adventure that editor Stark Lee Davenport called The Death of Granny Fernandez. I, Stark Lee Davenport, shall never forget that early July afternoon last week when my cousin Annabelle Lee Davenport and I drove out to attend the funeral of Granny Fernandez and Annabelle Lee's old Nash Rambler. The car was a small one, and on this account, most of the mourners had to stand outside in the weeds while the funeral service was being carried on in the back seat. The old cadaver kept slipping sideways, jostling the minister's arm and making it difficult for him to keep his place in the text. We will find in our Southland even today that colorful and wayward characters like Granny Fernandez often impose fanciful and eccentric burial stipulations in their wills, and and that in consequence of this, their funeral arrangements are sometimes likely to border on the grotesque. Be that as it may, I, Starkley Davenport, had been asked by certain members of the Fernandez family to deliver one of my popular poetic eulogies at the ceremony. From what I had been able to determine, Granny Fernandez had passed away suddenly in the kitchen of a downtown cafeteria, the Albright on South Canal Street not a very savory locale, I'm afraid, where for many years she had been employed as a food handler. Her passing had occurred as a result of one of the frequent altercations to which her somewhat irascible disposition inclined her insofar as relations with fellow cafeteria workers were concerned. In this case, a rather violent dispute with a young, half-witted dishwasher named Roy Sly Lasting over an hour and destroying a sizable portion of the kitchen had erupted when Granny allegedly purloined several of Sly's camel cigarettes and then made hurtful remarks about his mother, his sisters, and his dog, Rupert. When the melee ended, Granny lay dead, fatally brained by a 72-ounce can of cling peaches. A bloody potato peeler was found clutched in her hand. Sly was hospitalized with multiple bites, gouges, contusions, and puncture wounds. Not on the face of it an overly promising subject for a poetic eulogy, perhaps, but as it has long been my philosophy that the true poet sows beauty where he can, no matter how out the kilter or meager the soil, I had done my best, and I found myself not unpleased with the result which I called Obeyed to Granny Fernandez. Granny, adieu. Revoir, sweet mimosa blossom. Farewell, beloved vine, cut down in prime. No more your pearly smile doth fizz. Oh, silence now, your twinkling eye, since cling peaches in a can did whiz from out the hand of wretched sly. Adieu, adieu, dear Granny Fernandez. 
After the eulogy interval, the body was taken from the car. A fresh grave had been dug in a nearby bean field. But the burial had to be postponed as wild hogs broke in and consumed most of the body. This is something that happens far too often at our rural southern funerals, in my estimation. Unfortunately, there was nothing to do but return to the city with my cousin Annabelle Lee and her car. The ride back was rather somber and, and muted, owing to melancholy feelings engendered by the hog's behavior. But I could at least comfort myself with the thought that when my cousin and I arrived back at my rooming house, there was a pretty good chance she might be persuaded to tarry for a few hours and perhaps even sit on my... At this point, my friend Linoleum G. Nespy broke off in her reading and said, It keeps on like that for the six more pages, Stark Lee, and I am afraid that from this point on it becomes not only crazy sounding but frankly salacious. My God, I said. As I say, it came in the mail to my house yesterday, continued Miss Nesby, handing the magazine across the table to me. It surprised me, Stark Lee, because I had no idea you were planning to get out a new edition of the Edgar Allan Poe Messenger so soon. And then when I saw the cover, I thought, my, what a peculiar picture of Mr. Poe. Of course, when I read a few pages, I realized it couldn't be your work, and I said to Sister, Sister, all this business about funeral services held in the back of automobiles and fatal cans of peaches and wild hogs, it just doesn't sound like Stark Lee. Somebody is playing a trick here, I think. Sister agreed. She said to me, Linoleum, you just take that nasty thing right over and show it to Stark Lee first thing in the morning. I, Stark Lee Davenport, stared at the magazine. It was truly monstrous. The whole thing was a blatant parody of my beloved journal, the Edgar Allan Poe Messenger, and, and the cover even featured an awful photograph of the master himself, the master, of course, being Poe, very crudely altered. In fact, he'd been made to look like a lunatic. His beautiful dark eyes had been tampered with to such an extent that they now appeared as two mad little dots fixed and staring from his head. The contents were even more of a travesty. Why, why, this whole story about the death of Granny Fernandez is a pack of lies from start to finish, I said. I never in my life attended such a funeral, and as you know, Linoleum, I have no cousin by the name of Annabel Lee. I think it was the sorriest, most grotesque job of bogus counterfeiting I ever saw. It had clearly been put together by someone with a very twisted sense of humor and no ear at all for any of the finer nuances of my style. It made me think instantly of my old enemy, the notorious Jim Howard, because of how he often insists on introducing warped and off-colored material into his so-called writings, and he was perfectly capable of attempting to besmirch my reputation in the literary community by executing such a foul parody of the messenger, having the thing printed up and then mailing copies out to my readership. I think that I had best make a few phone calls, I said grimly, and, and see how many other readers may have received copies of this fetid sham. Twenty minutes on the phone confirmed the worst of my suspicions. Well, I told Miss Nesby when I sat down again, I was able to reach five local subscribers, and every one of them said they had received a copy of this lurid simulacrum. Gad, what perfidy! It's the work of that damned, odious Jim Howard, I'm sure of it. He's out to discredit me in the eyes of the entire Southern literary community. Miss Nesby jiggled her crutches unhappily. Oh, Stark Lee, she said, whatever will you do? Jamming a cigarette into my holder, I commenced to pace the room. The only thing I can do is issue an immediate denial, I said. Let's see, this is Wednesday. The Sydney Lanier Society is meeting tonight at the Hotel... Jefferson Davis, downtown. I'll start with them. Present my case and make the facts known. Very well, Linoleum, see how this sounds. Ladies and gentlemen of the Sidney Lanier Society, I, Starkley Davenport, the old South Poet of Richmond, Virginia, stand here before you tonight as one who has been grievously wronged. In this dark and perfidious hour, I am reminded of the great hero, Davy Crockett, the time he was lost for over six months in the woods down around Memphis, Tennessee. 
Finally, after a great deal of wandering, Davy broke out of the bushes and spied a log cabin dead ahead. Well, he hadn't had any poontang and a coon's age, and so when he saw this knot hole in the side of the cabin that was just the right size and height, he couldn't believe his luck. He ran over there and tore open his britches and, and stuck his great long thane in that old knot hole and commenced to give it what for. Presently, this fella came from out the cabin and said, Stranger, we'd be obliged if you'd come in the house and do that from the inside out. Right now, we're trying to have supper in here. Wonderful, Starkly, wonderful, said Miss Nesby, applauding. Yes, I said, isn't it? Sometimes I surprise even myself. Well, now that I've taken care of that, perhaps you'd like to see me crawl through this tennis racket. See, I've removed all the strings. It'll be a tight fit, but I believe I can wriggle through, especially if I remove all my clothing and grease myself down with a great big old handful of lard. At this point, my friend Linoleum G. Nesby broke off in her reading and said, it keeps on like that for 12 more pages, Stark Lee, and I'm afraid that on every one of those 12 pages, there's no mistaking the sly leer of a sensualist. My God, I said. I, Stark Lee Davenport, stared at the magazine. It was truly monstrous. I felt as if the room were spinning, whirling us into waters that were dark and uncharted. Not only had some deranged brain created a crude parody issue of The Messenger in an effort to ruin me, but to make matters even more insidious, they had cast the magazine in the form of a story within a story, a veritable hellish labyrinth, as it were. Jamming a cigarette into my holder, I commenced to pace the room in a state of high agitation as I struggled to order my thoughts and decide how best to deal with the situation. Very well, I said at last. It's obvious that we're dealing here with a very twisted and devious intelligence indeed. I can no longer suppose that my old enemy, the odious Jim Howard, had anything to do with this because, frankly, he hasn't the brains. However, whomever the culprit may be, I see now there is only one thing to do. And what is that, Stark Lee? said Miss Nesby tremulously. You and I, linoleum, together, we must both drink poison, I said. Oh, Stark Lee, do you really think so? Miss Nesby rattled her crutches nervously. Isn't there some other way? I'm afraid not, I said. However, my dear, do not be downhearted. Before we craft the fatal dram, let's you and I, together, enter the sweet perfume garden of sexual excess. You mean? But of course, I don't think there could be any secret that I have a thing for a handicapped person such as yourself. So before we drink poison and cash in our tickets, let me kneel here on the hearth rug. Then you can thrash me with an inch of my life with your crutches, and after that, once I have achieved an omission, we can go on to explore the wondrous kingdom of leather garments, solvent sniffing, and... At this point, my friend Linoleum G. Nesby broke off in a reading and said... It keeps on like that for 24 more pages, Stark Lee, and I'm afraid that it doesn't get any better either. My God, I said. I, Stark Lee Davenport, stared at the magazine. I felt as if the room were spinning, whirling us into dark, roiling waters. This was truly monstrous. A story within a story within a story. Jamming a cigarette into my holder, I commenced to pace the room in a perfect fury of cogitation. Very well, I said at last. I see now there is only one thing to do. And what is that, Stark Lee? asked Miss Nesby, half fearfully. Why, I must seek the help of the only man in the world who is capable of fathoming such a labyrinth, I said. And who might that man be, said Miss Nesby. Why, none other than the mighty genius Benny Pilcher, I cried. I, Starkly Davenport, saw that this was my only hope and that I wouldn't have any problems with Benny Pilcher to help me. At one time or another in my job as medical attendant at Sunset Gunner Clinic, the very laxly run private sanitarium for wealthy alcoholics and pill abusers, I had encountered mentalities of a high of somewhat bizarre character. Of them all, Benny Pilcher was the greatest. He was the only man I knew capable of playing 16 simultaneous games of world-class championship chess 
all this while blindfolded and eating a ham sandwich. And he was also a champion bowler. Many who closely resemble the late actor Peter Sellers, if, if Sellers had been just under five feet in height with apple cheeks, widely spaced teeth, and an outsized head whose white blonde hair was combed forward into bangs, was at Sunset Gunner for starting a series of little fires aboard city public conveyances, buses, taxi cabs, and the like. But really, I had always considered this to be a mere picadillo and nothing much to fuss over where an intellect the caliber of Benny's was concerned. Benny's hobby was solving baffling mysteries. And as he, as he often said, Starkly, dear heart, don't hesitate to call on me if you're ever in a tight spot. And then he would laugh that wonderful high-pitched laugh of his. I therefore determined to take a taxi straight away to Sunset Gunner Clinic even though it was my day off. I felt confident that once Benny heard my story and applied his massive IQ to the problem at hand, my dilemma would be as good as resolved. And maybe while he was at it, Benny could be persuaded to give me a few free bowling tips too. I was weeping softly, unashamedly, as I gave thanks for Benny Pilcher. The End. And you say you suspect Benny of having a hand in this, asked Dr. Swink, the kindly old medical director of Sunset Gunner Clinic. A scroll Bavarian pipe curved down from the corner of his mouth, and he cupped it in his hand, sucking meditatively and exhaling faint wisps of blue smoke as he studied the bogus copy of the Edgar Allan Poe messenger I had just laid on his desk. Yes, sir, I said, I'm pretty sure Benny is the one behind it. Why, you yourself said that last month he managed to get into your office here when you were away at a seminar. Dr. Swink chuckled. Yes, he did, didn't he? Jimmy the Lock came right in and made himself at home and answered half my mail before Nurse Hoffman noticed the door was open and caught him at it. Quite imaginative reply as they were, too. Imitated me almost perfectly. He chuckled again. Well, I went on, don't you see? Now he's up to the same tricks with me. I made the mistake last month of showing him a copy of my magazine, the Edgar Allan Poe Messenger, our special all-star issue. We were in the day room, and Benny expressed interest in borrowing a copy. So naturally, thinking it might be beneficial therapy for him, being exposed to the best in old South culture and verse, I said yes. Usually all he wants to do is read trashy bowling periodicals. Yes, he's very fond of bowling, mused Dr. Swink. In fact, it's part of his delusional system. Likes to fancy himself as the world champion. Yes, yes, I said impatiently. But the point is, after I'd loaned him the issue, he apparently took it into his head to create his own version. And here's the result, this freakish counterfeit atrocity. Oh, it's perfectly awful. Lewd gibberish from start to finish. And, and he's been mailing it out to my readership, too. Now, now, Stark Lee sued Dr. Swink. Surely you're exaggerating the harm that's been done. No, sir, I don't think I am. Because, well, look, look at how he's gone about it. It's a narrative within a narrative within a narrative. You no sooner, no sooner think that you've, you've come to the end of the thing when it, when it starts over. It's nerve-wracking. Worse than that, it creates a sort of doubt that can never be dispelled. Oh, I said, wringing my hands in agitation, I fear this thing has irreparably damaged my credibility. Because don't you see, Dr. Swink, from now on, whenever one of my readers opens a copy of the Edgar Allan Poe Messenger, they're going to remember this terrible, bogus issue. And they'll be, keep, and they'll be kept wondering if, if the thing is going to suddenly go all crazy on them again. Or, or, or is it indeed a genuine? Or, or is it merely another trap, another cruel fake, leading them into yet another place where reality gives way to deranged fantasy to nothing but accumulated projections of warped ravings which exist only in the sick brain of a, of a certified lunatic? Oh, Oh, I can't stand it. It's too horrible to feel myself eternally trapped like, like doll furniture in the fetid mansions of Benny Pilcher's mind. Dr. Swink had laid down his pipe. He licked his lips and looked strangely desperate. For heaven's sake, Davenport, he hissed, leaning toward me across the desk. For heaven's sake, keep your voice down. Do, do you want the master to overhear you? The master, I echoed blankly. Do you mean Poe? No, you fool, whispered Dr. Swink. I mean the real master, 
I mean, Benny Pilcher. If he should chance to overhear your unmanly snivelings or even suspect that we were having this little talk, well, well, there's no telling what he might do. I shudder to think what... Ah! As I watched dumbfounded, the doctor made an abortive attempt to stand up. Then he fell back, gurgling in his throat like some spastic thing. I asked Dr. Lee Davenport, could, could barely make out his strangled words. Fond of bowling. Before his right hand in a jerky motion as though impelled by some powerful outside force or current, snapped up toward his face. Next moment he had plunged two fingers into his own eye sockets and his, his thumb had entered his mouth. I saw that he was sitting there holding his own head like a bowling ball. But I saw something else, too, in that frozen, timeless moment. From the upper right-hand corner of the ceiling, out of thin air itself, an enormous hand was coming down at me, swiftly, irritably, as though reaching out to turn over the record. <laughs> <laughs>